Welcome to Rebuilding Careers. I'm Bonnie Pomish, the CEO of Working Wardrobes, and I have the pleasure today of being here with Marissa Waldman, a member of our board and the CEO of Leader Leaderology, and Derek Benson, Working Wardrobes' very own Chief People Officer. Welcome. Thank you for having me. It's so nice to take some time out of just the regular day to day to have an intentional conversation. And I thank you both so much for dedicating this time to doing just that today. At Working Wardrobes, we often talk about this tagline, you know, the power of a paycheck and how that statement is really embodying empowerment and the empowerment that we give to our clients. And it is an aspirational goal for our clients, right? To have more empowerment, more choices, the ability to be and present and bring more of themselves into the world. We often also share our first paycheck stories as a bit of an icebreaker. And I would love to kind of switch that question up a little bit and ask each of you today, if you want, share with us how you earned your first paycheck. And what I really wanna know, what are some of the lessons from that first job that have shaped your career path? Marissa, do you mind getting us started? Wow, that's a great question. That is a really, really good question. Um, so my first, my first job was in sales at a company called Windsor Fashions, and it was very prestigious to get to to be um, making three thirty five an hour <laughs> back in nineteen eighty. Um, at Del Amo Fashion Square in Torrance. And um, I, I worked hard and I loved every second of it, including um, during the holidays, they played nonstop Alvin and the Chipmunks seeing all the Christmas carols, which, <laughs> you know, one can only put up with so much. But um, in terms of lessons learned, it was it's interesting because I have always had a very strong owner's mindset. Um, and I feel like I, I, not that I thought I owned Windsor Fashions clearly, um, but I really felt a very big responsibility to show up and give my best to that job. Um, nothing was too small for me to do. And um, I loved it. I loved the responsibility. I loved the work. And so I think the, I don't know, the lesson and all that is that um, I can make an impact even when I'm making three thirty-five an hour, helping people pick out their clothes. So amazing too, how you took that empowerment to learn so many more roles beyond your own. And I love that, that owner's mindset. I'm going to have to borrow that language. That's fantastic. How about you, Derek? What were some of the lessons from your first job that have shaped your career? Well, my first job was Baskin Robbins. <laughs> and my dad decided I needed a job if I wanted to be able to drive, um, you know, to pay for gas and insurance. He was going to do it. It's very expensive for teenagers and especially teenage boys. Uh, so my dad went in and got an application for me to work at Baskin Robbins. I filled it out, got a job. Um, some of the response, you know, some of the things that I learned was just responsibility and getting that paycheck that I could pay for my own way. And so I didn't have to ask my parents for things. And I think that kind of um, helped to build my um, independence uh, growing up. And plus we got free ice cream. So it's a benefit. <laughs> I'm like, you had me at ice cream. I was like, yeah, what was your favorite flavor? That's <laughs> right. Peanut butter and chocolate. Yay. I don't know that I ever had a favorite, but I think ice cream in general. Yes. Yeah. Ice cream, ice cream, we all scream for ice cream. Ice cream is um, favorite flavor, yes. Yeah, ice cream is my favorite flavor. Derek, you were describing really this sort of investment that your dad made in your career by taking you and making sure that you had that access to get there. And this is um, just very similar to the work that we do with a lot of the clients we serve is getting them the resources to be able to, to do that, that work. And in that case, the barrier that you needed to overcome was transportation and your dad was making that difference. Um, I'm curious, as we talk about these experiences of people investing in our careers, and maybe Derek, you can start this one off. Um, have, do you have another example of someone investing in your career? Maybe not that early on, maybe later on in your career. Um, 
What? I do. Um, I had a couple of jobs that were pretty entry level coming in. Either I was between jobs or, you know, just didn't know quite what I wanted to do next. And um, one of them that I took was a temporary uh, uh, assignment. And I was in this assignment for just a couple of weeks. And the manager of the department said, you're way overqualified for this. This, you know, you, you don't need to be handling fax papers that are coming through and stapling them and logging them or whatever. And she um, kind of paved the way for me to go and meet another manager within the organization, get an interview. And um, I, again, I was hired and um, it started a great career. This was actually option one. I was there for nine years and worked my way up uh, through several positions. And, and it was because this one person, you know, recognized my, um, my work ethic and said, hey, you know, let's, let's see if we can find something else for you. I had no experience in that area. It was all new. But you know what I, so I often also worked at option one and um, I, Derek and I did not actually, we may have overlapped for 10 minutes or something, but we didn't actually work together. And that organization was very much focused. The culture was very focused on developing others and, and um, recognizing talent and, and promoting from within. Um, so the, the culture there, Derek had a specific manager who was incredible, who helped him, but I would say that was really not uncommon in that culture at option one mortgage. <laughs> That's incredible that you both worked there and wasn't, I would, if I were the CEO of that company, I'd be very proud to hear you reflecting on that culture, even today, that it was strong in developing the career paths of individuals. We've been reading as a management team, this Gallup book, It's the Manager. And if there was one principal takeaway from that, it's just about how important it is for each of us to invest in the growth of the people we have the, the privilege of leading. 100%. Well, and sometimes like the investments that people make in us are not even the, the lessons that speak the loudest. Sometimes it's just, we made a really good mistake and we learned a lot from it. Do either or both of you have examples of, of that, of really, you know, learning significantly from a mistake, maybe something funny, maybe something serious, but just a major takeaway? Oh my gosh, probably so many. I think that, um, I don't know that this would be considered a mistake, but it was, um, something it was a lack of knowledge. And so early in my career, I was a career counselor um, actually, for about 14 years, I worked in the outplacement industry, which was um, coaching and career career management. And I kind of fell into the job by accident and couldn't believe they paid me for it. It was incredible fun. And really, really early on, I was I think I was maybe 26 and I was facilitating a group of um, people who had been um, laid off. And they were primarily out of the finance department of a major corporation. And they were talking about the big six. And um, I remember thinking, is that like the PAC 10? Like what, what is the big six? And so instead of showing my ignorance, I said, well, tell me more about that. Because they asked me a question like, how do you blah, blah, blah. So I said, tell me more about that. So they start talking about these accounting firms. Um, and this was before a lot of them had consolidated. And I remember thinking, um, okay, this, <laughs> that's what that is. And later they told me what a great facilitator I was because I didn't answer questions. I would stimulate the conversation amongst the, um, the, the cohort. And I remember thinking that's because I didn't have, the, <laughs> I didn't have the answers. So I faked it and it worked. Great. So. Um, I think the lesson in all that is that um, groups are very powerful. Humans are very powerful. They have the answers within themselves. And so as an executive coach, as a leader, I rely a lot on asking great questions, not necessarily having the answers and knowing that the humans are smart, 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 and will 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 come up with the best answers themselves. Wow, that is so, I mean, just the, the segue between those two pieces too, right? Because that's also where you have the best development, I think, right. not when you're given the answer, but when you're asked the questions mm -hmm. and able to do that reflection and discovery process individually. 
Right. So I look really smart, but the truth is I don't know. <laughs> so I, I'm stealing that from you. I throw that in the good. Um, yeah, it makes me a great boss. Cause I'm like, that's, that's really good. What would you, what would you recommend? What do you think? Um, mm-hmm. and it makes it a lot less lonely, uh, because mm-hmm. you don't have to have all the answers. So, yeah. Yeah. How about you, Derek? So mine's, uh, at a different level than Marissa's, <laughs> uh, the, uh, the mistake that I made that I was thinking of, um, was when I was a server at Marie Callender's. <laughs> And it was my last weekend on the job because I was looking for something that was full time and it was Mother's Day. And the manager asked me, would you please just stay through Mother's Day? We need the help. And I thought, okay, great, I will. And uh, I dumped a whole tray of champagne and drinks on a mother. (laughs) Um, I was horrified. um, And uh, (laughs) I think the lesson that I learned, I mean, we comped her meal and uh, offered to pay her dry cleaning. And, you know, of course I apologize up and down. I probably was 50 sheets of red. Um, But the uh, the, um, lesson that I learned was to not rush. You know, I think I was trying to do too much at once. I was trying to, you know, take more than I could at a time. Um, And, you know, that was, it also told me that I made the right decision to leave um, (laughs) serving tables. (laughs) what I did. <laughs> and it also taught me to, to treat servers well, because I learned what they go through. I mean, it's, that's a tough job. It's so. a super tough job. Isn't champagne good for your hair though? Or is that beer? There's something, maybe you're giving her a spa treatment for mother's day. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, really, this is good you. for you. Yeah, for your skin. It's on the house. Really. <laughs> Oh my goodness. What's fascinating to me too about your um, sharing that story, Derek, is the ripple effects. Mm-hmm. And often, you know, you were describing it like as a personal experience, right? Like I was taking too much on my plate. And in a metaphoric way, I think we don't really realize sometimes us having too much on our plates and how that affects other people, especially when we're in the HR space in a leadership space that there, there's a lot at stake. Um, and we, we sometimes I think maybe under credit our ability to affect positive or negative ripple effects as, as a result of the choices we make. Yeah. And that's why on the airplanes, they always say, put the oxygen mask on yourself first. Exactly. Um, yep. That's all, that's all you do all day long is take care mm-hmm. of the most important asset in the organization, the humans. Right. So yeah, you gotta exactly vision heal thyself first. Exactly. Exactly. Is that a trend like in HR? Would you, and maybe there are other trends, but is that, is that a trend? This take care of the self-care before taking care of self before others. It should be a trend. It is not a trend. <laughs> it's, mm-hmm. it's something that I preach constantly. Mm-hmm. Um, mental health is um, the biggest conversation that HR people are having um, at conferences and things these days and um, removing the stigma and really providing solutions. Mm-hmm. And they um, don't then necessarily take their own medicine. And so I'm always running around to my friends and colleagues in HR and saying, how can I help? What can I do so that you can be good to you so that you can continue to be good to the whole rest of the world? So, but it's not a trend. (laughs) I have seen, I've seen more and more uh, HR people talking about burnout and saying that they need to take care of themselves. So I think it's finally, people are starting to realize it. Um, I, I'm terrible at it myself. I'm always worried about everybody else. It's always the family, the friends, the coworkers, the company. And then I forget to take care of myself. And uh, I was just telling Bonnie this morning that I did a day of just for me on Friday. Wow. And it was amazing. I was like, wow, is this what retired feels like? Or, <laughs> you know, being, I don't know, a, a rock star or something. I just did everything I did. I did for me for the day. And um, you know, it was amazing. It felt really good. Oh, when are you going to do it again? <laughs> good question, Marissa. I don't know. Maybe every other Friday off be my focus. Mm-hmm. Don't mm-hmm. make us hold you accountable. 
Well, this is actually, you're touching on this a little bit, Derek, in terms of the, you know, company-wide ways that we are taking care of our people. And one of that, those ways has been this alternative work week schedule where we work a 980 and everyone has, you know, one day off every other week and these longer periods of time to be able to really get into the work. And I am hearing so much more on those Monday mornings about folks having taken care of themselves. So that's, I love that trend here at Working Wardrobes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Are there other HR trends that you both of you could share with me? What's what's going on in this industry? I mean, what's what are you seeing in 2022? And really curious, what's on the horizon in, in 2023? I mean, I would have I was going to mention the 980 schedule that a lot of people are looking for flexibility. That's a big thing. Right. People want to work from home. They want to have um, they want to be able to incorporate their their life into work. It's you know, they used to say work-life balance. Now they say work-life integration or they come up with some other term. But, um, you know, if somebody needs to go to their kids play at 10 o'clock in the day, you know, and they can come back and finish their work and maybe work an hour later or whatever, you know, that's what people are looking for. They want some flexibility. And I think that we jumped on that um, and did a really good job earlier this year by offering the 980 schedule so that people could have three-day weekends every other week. Two-thirds of our staff are doing it and love it. Um, and also remote days, allowing people to work from home one or two days a week if their job allows for it. And, um, you know, that's one or two days that you don't have to commute to work, get up and, I don't know, even take a shower. <laughs> you know, It's like throw a shirt on. And unless you're in front of a camera, I mean, you can do your job and um, and be at home. And then, you know, you can be home when the kids come home from school or you can throw, you know, something on the stove and finish up or whatever. And I, I really think that's what a lot of people are looking for is that kind of flexibility. Mm -hmm. Well, and I love the piece about being in person with intention or with purpose, that there is oftentimes a lot of the work that I'm able to do at home that I could not get done at the office. Like I need absolute no interruptions and mm -hmm. that creates a space for that too. And I'm able to manage my, my workflow that way. What about you, Marissa? What are you noticing on the, the horizon in 2023 in terms of HR trends? 100% uh, what, what Derek was talking about with regard to that also big emphasis on mental health. Again, the, the pandemic exacerbated all of these things. Yeah. And so there was already conversations um, around that with the great resignation happening and, and those things that I was not particularly surprised by because there's been a war on talent for so long mm -hmm. and um, people in the workforce saying, I care about where I work. I care about the um, the purpose of the organization I work for. I want my work to have meaning. Um, and if it doesn't, then, then the resignation is is just, it's gonna happen because there's other ways for me to, to get at what I wanna get at. Um, I'm also seeing around the DE&I, um, DEIB space, a shift that I was kind of tickled about. I was at a conference a couple of weeks ago and the um, the CHRO for the New York Times was talked about um, being an ally in that space isn't enough. She talked about being an accomplice. And I was like, okay, now we have to talk because I need to know what you mean by that. And she said, so being an ally is, you know, you, you make sure that you're hiring diverse candidates, you, you're, you know, putting those things forward. An accomplice is saying, um, Frank, that's a great idea. Do you know that Susan just said it five minutes ago? Those kinds of things, like really being a disruptor and really getting in there. And, and I, I thought this was fascinating because I liken it to, um, if you've ever known anybody who takes, who's had a, has had an organ transplant, People who have had organ transplants are on anti-rejection drugs forever because the system is trying to reject this foreign body. The system, you know, the, the human said, I want a new kidney. So they went out and sought it, but then their body rejects it. Well, the same thing happens in corporations. Corporations say we want diversity. We want to have women, people of color, gender, religion, et cetera, at the top. So they hire for that, but then the system rejects that mm -hmm. foreign body and the, um, the 
initiative fails, right? And they say, oh, you know, we've, we've, we've hired Black people from that university before. They didn't work out. Well, what did the system do to keep that foreign body from being rejected? What was the anti-rejection medication that the, that the system adopted to make sure that person was successful? Um, and that's where that accomplice piece comes in, where um, it's not enough to do it. You have to go, you have to go the distance to make sure that that those initiatives and those people are successful. So that's been some that was when she talked about that, I was like, this is so, this is like next level. Um, mm -hmm. and I get all geeked out over that. So that's what I'm seeing out there. More, more, more. Well, and I love that too, because it's like onion layers. You're just getting right. deeper and deeper. And this human experience is a deep experience if we allow it and invite it at work as well. I mean, you're, um, I feel like probably your headstone is going to say something <laughs> about being fearlessly authentic, Marissa. And I hope this so. is a mantra <laughs> of your business. It's a mantra of who you are and it's an invitation. <clears throat> and now I see you taking that to the next level and that is becoming an accomplice to other people yeah. being fearlessly authentic. That's exactly right. I hadn't thought of that. You're right. I love it. <laughs> She's I, in. Got, I got your back. You go be, you go be you and I'll help, I'll help um, support and run cover and all the things so that you can step into your, your full self, because you're just that much cooler when you do. Yep. Yeah, totally. We all know someone who's out of work. Hundreds of thousands are unemployed in Southern California. Working Wardrobes is here to help. At no cost to you, our career coaches will get you job ready. The time is now. Time to update your resume. Time to practice interview skills. Time to get job training and time to learn new skills. It doesn't cost you a thing, but it can change your life. This is your time. Call Working Wardrobes at 714-210-2460. Speak with a career coach today. Well, this might be, it may be inherently the answer, but I'm curious about, so if you could like advise corporations as a, if you're going to put something at the top of the priority list in 2023 XYZ employer, what would it be? What would you advise people to really prioritize as employers in 2023? Go ahead, Derek. <laughs> I've got so much to say. I'll share yeah. Um, I was thinking, you know, just listen to your people, find out what it is that they want. Yeah. Stop trying to uh, guess for them and, you know, shove them through a box. Um, and then um, recognition is super important. Let people know that you care about them, that they're humans and all that good stuff, that they're important to the organization and, um, and accommodate some of these requests. and. Um, things and, and just, you know, make it work for everybody. 100%. Same answer, Marissa. Same answer. I mean, I, I have, um, I, I have a, a colleague right now who we used to work together at another organization and her, her daughter, who's now in middle school was, was, um, in first grade and she had to go, she had to, I have to leave early tonight because it's back to school night. And I said, Oh, good. And when you're there, um, the teacher's going to have on the board sticky notes of the things that that she or he needs for the for the classroom. Take a bunch of them off and expense them. We'll pay for it. And I said, the second thing is um, sign up to work in the classroom once a week, one hour, once a week. Do not get sucked into the PTA. Ugh, like, don't be with the don't be with the grownups. Go volunteer in the classroom. And she said, well, you know, I got to get to work. But I said, no, 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 no. Once a week, be in that classroom. You've got to see what's going on. Who's saying what to who? Who's friends? Who's the mean girl? Who's the you know the the BMOC? Get in there um, and spend that hour. And um, I, this all goes back to understand, accommodate what's important to your employees because spending that hour in the classroom made her a bazillion times more engaged and a better employee. And um, engaged employees, we know through all the research, the companies who have highly engaged employees who bring discretionary effort, they're the ones, yep. those are the companies that have are more successful business, business wise. So all these things that we talk about um, are not, yes, they're nice that you should do them because you're a nice person and you're a good leader, blah, blah, blah. They're good for business. They they're good for the bottom line the too. Bottom line. Mm -hmm. 
it's yeah. a good business decision. Mm -hmm. Um, and so to what Derek was saying, I'm like, preach. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. yes. People, people will give you everything if you see them as humans mm -hmm. who have complex and full lives. So, yeah. Well, and I think you even really started our conversation with a, a morsel of, of essentially that people are almost all companies' largest asset. And so that is absolutely worthy of investing in. Yeah. Yeah. Well, switching perspectives, what would your advice be to job seekers in this coming year? Marissa? <laughs> I'm so, again, I've got a lot of stuff to say. Um, First and foremost, look inward and know yourself. When I work with anybody going through transition, I always talk about inward, outward, forward. So um, we spend we spend more time at work than we do doing any single thing else, right? I am with my colleagues more than I'm with my children who I'm desperately in love with. And so we want to love the work we're doing, if at all possible, and you know, moving in the direction toward finding a career that is, is personally very fulfilling. And so step one, really look inward, have tough conversations with yourself, figure out what motivates you, figure out what you hate to do. What you hate to do is almost as important as what you love to do. Um, so spend that time, invest that time up front before, like resist the urge to jump in and start sending out resumes and applications. Spend the time really being clear about your, um, your product, right? Looking for a job is, is just a big marketing process. And before you figure out who to sell the product to, you've really got to know what is the unique value proposition about the product, meaning you. So yeah. that's my first advice. Look inward. Oh, know thyself. Be, oh, I'm sorry. Um, I, and networking, I think is super important. Um, <clears throat> once you figure that out, Tell everybody that you know, everybody. tell your family, <laughs> tell your friends, tell your, you know, coworkers, tell your, your um, electronic network, um, because everyone knows of stuff that's going on that you don't. Um, and just like uh, Marissa said, you know, know what you don't want to do, let them know that too, um, so that they can, you know, offer things up and then just be open to opportunities that come up. I mean, I can't tell you how many things that I've done in my life that I never even thought of myself. But somebody else said, what do you think about this? And I went, oh, okay, let's give it a but try. Even, you know, even that, that manager, even that manager at option one that you were talking about mm -hmm. said, you know, you would be in, and okay. I love it. Yeah. Is there like, when you're describing all of this, it's kind of blowing me away when I think about the paradigm that I grew up in about employment, right? It was not about me. <laughs> it was very much about, you know, um, sort of this sort of achiever orientation, right? Like whatever the expectation is, you know, hit the target and, you know, be, uh, be a good team player and all those things, but just meet the expectation. I don't feel like I actually had a voice in my employment experience until I came into leadership roles. And in the last like five years, this shift has become a boon, which is, I think, amazing. But it really knocks my socks off that that kind of a, a swing of the pendulum, if you will, just in my own lifetime. And I'm, I'm not even, I mean, I'm not even middle aged. Like this is, you know, just this period of time. So is what's knocking your socks off? Are, are you becoming aware of a new industry or a new concept is what is in the HR space maybe that you've been hearing about and you're curious to learn more about like just what's kind of blowing your mind about what's what's happening in this industry right now or this coming down the pike maybe Marissa let you go first <laughs> Aren't you a gentleman? Um, I, you know, it's interesting. I'm, I'm not sure. I'm look. I'm watching to see what artificial intelligence is doing as it relates to the corporate world and how that's going to impact employees. Um, uh, robots are interesting. I've got a client right now who his whole business is around robots in the construction industry, and his son said to him, "Well, does that mean your?" Um, putting people out of work. And he said, no, because somebody's going to fix the robots and somebody's going to program the robots and somebody's going to, um, 
you know, clean the robots, whatever, but the, but the robots will do the work that will make it a much safer industry. There will be less deaths and less, less injuries, et cetera. Um, so I'm, I'm interested to watch that, but you know, it's interesting. I don't think it is a paradigm. I think that, I think that, or how do I say this? I do, people don't hire, people don't come up with a job because they, they like you. They come up with a job because they have a need, right? They're, they need something. It's a business. They have something they need accomplished. And so there is still what you were raised with, with, you know, make yourself useful, get involved, be a great employee, et cetera. That is still critical. And that is who should be hired and developed and promoted and all those things. People with the, let me add it attitude, but at the same time, employers need to understand that there is a war on talent. And if you want the best and the brightest, then it is a two-way um, employee-employer relationship value proposition. And you need to be providing value to these fabulous people who um, are working for you. So isn't that it? Like that's the equity and inclusion part yeah. of that equation yeah. is that we are equitable partners with our employer. I mean, that's, I think the, the shift is, yeah, yeah you but matter. It's, still, but it's been coming, right? It's been coming mm. for a long time. And um, with technology and with all these shifts that we've seen over the last 30, 40 years, it's been coming and the pandemic, ex it accelerated it. But none of it is like, oh, you know, where did this come from? I, you, we've seen it. And I, again, I was in the outplacement industry when in the 80s and 90s, when there was just massive downsizing and mergers and acquisitions. And this whole generation of, of millennials that people say are spoiled and, you know, what's in it for me, they all saw their parents sell their soul to corporate America and they saw mom and dad not come to their baseball games and all the things and then get laid off for it. Right. Yeah. And so they're sort of like, mm, why would I sell my soul to corporate America? I saw mom and dad do that and they got laid off and I am going to bring my talents where my talents are respected and valued. And, um, there's not going to be 30 years in a gold watch that just that's gone. And it's gone because the employers broke the contract, um, not the employees. And so, you know, there's a, the other thing that's happening right now is there's a massive upswing in union activity in the first half of 2022. I have this written down somewhere. Cause again, I was at this conference. I was learning all kinds of crazy stuff. In the first half of 2022, there were like 600 union elections um, in the United States. So there's a, there's a big upswing in employee, um, activism, right. Whether it's from a union perspective or, um, all the different political things that are happening, there's a, there's an uprising of employees who are saying, this is what I believe and corporation who I work for, what do you believe? And are we aligned? Um, mm -hmm. and that is something that is, it's coming from, it's coming from within. And, you know, in the sixties, there was all kinds of activism, but those people weren't not necessarily part of the um, corporate engine. <laughs> um, now all these employee resource groups and all the things that are happening, they're, they're having a voice and companies are paying attention. Even companies that aren't consumer facing um, are being kind of called on the carpet. So I think this is like macro level empowerment. This is individuals, but in groups owning their power. And this is the power that we're looking to give to each of the people that we have the privilege of helping is to own their own power and right. to contribute their, their value um, in the world. Yep. All right, before we wrap up, I, I have beyond enjoyed this conversation. I would love to just impart some words of wisdom, some advice, anything that's resonating with you right now that you would like to share with our listeners. Maybe it's advice you've heard recently, maybe a quote that's speaking to you, but a little inspiration sandwich for the end of our podcast. <laughs> Go ahead, Derek. I mean, I think that <clears throat> a lot of great things were, were mentioned today. Um, I, I would just say for people, you know, just be open 
um, to opportunities and um, don't pigeonhole yourself. I think that um, I, I made that mistake for a little while in my career, you know, thinking I had to stay within an industry, be open to lots of different things, um, be curious, learn, um, stay in touch, network. It's great, great advice. I couldn't agree more. Um, I would add to that um, a little ditty around imposter syndrome. I think a lot of people struggle with imposter syndrome. And I think that when you try and fake it, um, it ends up it ends up reinforcing the imposter syndrome. And so I say, lean into the imposter syndrome and embrace it. And to Derek's point about being curious, say, I don't know, but I'll find out. And let's go talk to people and 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 really go out and seek information. I think that people don't realize that nobody knows. They see people who are successful and they think they were kind of just have always had that and if if and have never made mistakes and have never suffered and have never made a fool of themselves. And if 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 they tell you that they're lying. Um and so it don't be afraid to lean into the imposter syndrome and say, I, how do I do this? I don't know. And go talk. And if somebody doesn't have the answer, go find somebody else. Mm -hmm. um, because, because we're all making this stuff up as we go along and learning. And the people who are the most successful are the ones who admit that and embrace it. Mm -hmm. I think that's also like one of the most um, alluring, maybe not the right word, but like one of the most um, highly appreciated, if you will, um, personality traits in people and especially in people we're hiring is can they learn? Are they trainable? Right. Mm -hmm. Are they curious? And like you said, Derek, curious and open and engaged in whatever is happening. This human experience is so much better when we share it. And today was no exception. Derek and Marissa, thank you so much for joining me today. I certainly learned a few things and will continue to reflect on this conversation as I'm sure our listeners will too. Thank you so much for tuning in to this episode of Rebuilding Careers. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.